Welcome to the Educause Rising Voices podcast, where we amplify the voices of young professionals in higher education. My name is Sarah Buska, and I'm joined by Wes Johnson. <laughs> and we are part of the Educause Young Professionals Advisory Committee, or WIPAC. And we are the hosts of this podcast. Welcome. How are you doing today, Wes? I am doing good. The holidays are about to come up. Uh, we were talking earlier before the show about the need for recharge. I'm very much looking forward to forgetting about work for a little period of time yeah. and getting the shock of coming back. How, how about yourself? As as well, I'm feeling very similarly. Um, I'm also thrilled to introduce John O'Brien and Chris Bradney to the show. Hi, John. Hi, Chris. How are you? Hello. We're also looking forward to uh, some recharge time as well. You too, Chris, I assume. <laughs> yeah, love it. Yes. Well, the problem is it takes it takes three days or two days just to for your heart rate to uh, <laughs> settle. And that, so it's really just like three to, you know, so, but hell, I'll take them uh, however I can because it's, exactly. it's neat. Yeah, don't, don't ruin it with the data. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, we are so thrilled to have you both here joining us today um, for this really important topic to talk about strategic planning. And I don't think we could be joined by better folks to discuss this topic with us and young professionals. So before we dive in, one thing we really love doing on this show is asking folks to introduce yourself, share your name, your position, the institution and what your superpower is. So John, we'd like to start with you. Would you be willing to introduce yourself to our audience? John O'Brien, I'm the president uh, and CEO of Educause. Superpower, you know, I, I'm somewhat joking, but my family would say my superpower is worrying. <laughs> <laughs> which isn't always a healthy, um, you know, so so when we talk as a community about wellness, I, I, I know what that looks like, and you can call it worry or anxiety or, or whatever, but it is a superpower. I mean, for me, worrying is, is this sometimes unfortunate ability or tendency to look ahead. Uh, I used to love one of the happiest years of my life. I, I had free access to a pool table and a friend who was better than I at pool. And billiards are great because if you're playing, you're always thinking not, am I going to make this shot? But it's what about the next shot? And what about the next shot? And, you know, we're going to talk about strategic planning and that's what strategic planning is. For me personally, it also can convey itself. What about, uh, I think my- uh, Something happened with your microphone just then. <laughs> It just is randomly switching, so I'll switch back. Um, okay. Oh, well now the other mic isn't even available. Let's see. Computers are weird. Yeah. Nothing like a good Windows update to reshuffle <laughs> everything. <laughs> like, we didn't touch a button. We didn't do anything, and suddenly it decides <laughs> your mic needs to be turned off. Now we can't hear you at all. Just now we so can't you. hear you at all. <laughs> <laughs> nope, nothing. Nope. Here we go. No, and now it is, right? There you go. Yeah. There you go. Yep. Yeah. There we okay. go. Yep. yep. All right. So I'll try to pick it up where I, where I left off. Um, so like a good, in a good game of billiards, you're thinking about not just the shot I'm going for, but the one after and the one after. And we're going to talk about strategic planning where that's maybe the definition of strategic planning is thinking beyond the next shot. But but for me personally, you know, I do that maybe too much. Sometimes it's, it's you know, I don't enjoy the present moment enough because I'm thinking about what could, what's next and, and scenarios in my head about what could happen next. So, you know, it's a, it's a superpower except for when it's not, if that makes sense. I could have a better answer, but that's what's on my mind today. Chris, what well, about we were you? We just talking about vacations, yeah. too. So. Yeah, we were. We were talking about Very apropos. Yeah, yes. <laughs> well, uh, hello, everyone. Um, Chris Bradney, currently serving as the Director of Strategic Technology Initiatives at California State University, San Bernardino. Been here for about five years. I'm going on six years now. Uh, my superpower. I'm gonna. I'm gonna change it up. Not what Sarah's expecting. Um, I'm gonna say tenacity, and, and, I, and I say this for a specific reason. Uh, John and I have something in common, 
in that we both recently hit 1,000 days consecutive on Duolingo. So that takes <laughs> you know a lot of tenacity to keep that 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 streak up. So really really excited. I hit that uh, yesterday actually. So oh, congratulations. A lot of fun, a lot of fun getting there. Yeah. That is great. What what language are you were you studying? Uh, I'm studying Japanese right now. Ooh. And I'm and I'm I'm studying French. Wow. Well, hey, maybe, maybe your next vacations will bring you there, and you can actually practice when you're on vacation. I I, I started studying French on Duolingo in 2020, just before our big vacation to Paris. <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> Thanks, COVID. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I want to mention real quick for for the audience, if y'all don't mind, a, a, no, a little add on for Chris is that uh, that tenacity also plays a big role in this show you have here today. Uh, Chris is part of our editorial team, and he plays a big role in helping us set up these podcasts. So huge shout out and salute to you, Chris, for that tenacity, my friend. <laughs> I, I love it. it. It it brings me such joy. We can tell, and we're thrilled you're here. Thank you. So with that, we've been kind of swirling around the topic of strategic planning. And I just want to start off and maybe I'll ask John and then Chris, of course, we welcome you to chime in. Why is strategic planning crucial for higher education institutions today? Well, well, I think it's crucial because I think you would not plan a vacation that involved travel without some map and some sense of where you were going. You know, I think you could be overly regimented about a plan and and that, you know, you can do it badly. Well, you know, you can do anything badly, but when it's done well, when a strategic plan is done well, it sets a framework of how you're thinking about the future, brings people together. It's one of those things that, you know, the old saw about strategic planning is that it's the end product is less important than the process that got you there. It's it's by virtue of having people come together and talk about what matters to them and what's important to them and that that is always good. I, you know, I was on a, I was a provost of a large system and we went to do an HLC accreditation visit and we were there in Chicago meeting with the accreditor people and we looked around in the room and said we've never met on campus before. Like strategic planning and a travel to another city is what it took to get these key people together to talk about the future. So, you know, you, you, there are different opinions about how valuable strategic planning as an end product is. But as a process, I think it's absolutely crucial. And I will say, from my part, as an end product, it has been incredibly valuable. When I worked at the system as a deputy CIO, I was responsible for so overseeing strategic plans, uh, technology strategic plans at all of our 30 plus campuses. And so I got to see the whole gamut, plans that were, you could tell were really important and meaningful and consequential. And you could see right away plans that were meant to immediately go up on a shelf, gather dust and, and be nothing other than check the box that yes, we did a strategic plan. So I think it's valuable. I think the process is invaluable. Yeah, I, I love what you said, right? It there's there's so much value there in in having the conversations and and really making it not the we've checked the box we've done the work um i like to i like to think of strategy plans in higher education institutions like ships right uh, like a large cargo ship is going to take a long time to turn a long time to stop a long time to pivot and strategic planning is really just that looking ahead and saying okay well where are we trying to get to and now what are, you know, we're not going to prescribe every moment we're going to change what lever, but just our intention is we're going this direction. We've got to start, you know, moving the ship in this, in this direction. And, well, and I also, I, go ahead, please. I was say, the, other, the other thing I, I think that is really valuable for strategic planning is that it's really, it's really easy and fun to say yes to everything, but a, a good strategic plan is that filter of which you put, you know, decisions through to say, is this in line with where we're trying to go or is it not and it, and it's really that filter to be able to say no to what you need to say no to so you can actually get to something meaningful and valuable and and, and you know st we're we're probably well i'm thinking because we just did one of an of an institutional strategic plan like we like we did for for educause but you know any area can also have a strategic plan um 
I, I remember uh, I, I used to work in a large state system, you know, and it was super regulated, regimented. And so um, I was going to hire someone from another campus um, as a chief student affairs officer. And but, you know, the way it works, you can't give them more money for the same job. So it's sort of like, well, I really want you to come. I can't give you any more money. Um, and, and his answer endeared me to him for all of time. He said, well, I'm not interested in that. What I'm interested in is whether you'll let me do strategic enrollment management. And I said, well, hmm, okay, <laughs> I can live with that. <laughs> and in just that process of uh, enrollment management uh, strategic plan, the thing that about that that really uh, was unforgettable was it it keeps you from overreacting and oversteering in a way, too, when you have a plan. And like if you do strategic enrollment management, you say, Oh my gosh, enrollment's down. We're going to have to do this and this and this and this. Or you can say, yeah, and it's down because we know the demographics. And in the long term, in three years, it's going to be up. And we can sort of have a little more perspective. And it can, I I, I do think higher education has a certain propensity for oversteering at times, oversteering and being responsive versus strategic oversteering sometimes, as we all know in IT better than anybody, hype. Somebody went to a conference. <laughs> And, and uh oh, and then next thing you know, everybody's uh, jumping on some bandwagon or another. Being strategic is sort of an antidote to oversteering and maybe a little bit of an antidote to hype as well. That's a really great point. And something that I heard Chris say as well, along the same lines, John, is applying some type of a filter when thinking about strategic planning. And I'm curious, maybe this is question is for you, Chris. If you could talk more about what that filter actually is, what's under the hood, what does that look like? Because I think for many young professionals and folks just coming into higher education, we may not realize what that filter looks like, first of all, but also how to calibrate that to make it fit our environment. So what would you say, Chris? <laughs> I, I think it's a complicated answer, um, but, but I, let me let me tackle it in this way. There, you know, There's a couple things that I'm thinking about in, in terms of this filter. One is, you know, a strategic plan, when you're planning, there's there's going to be some very definite steps, action items that you're going to take immediately. But down the road into the future, right, there, it's not a crystal ball that you're going to be able to be able to 100 percent predict where, you know, where the what the future holds. And so a good strategic plan will, will really lay out what is the outcome we're trying to achieve? What's what you know, what is the change we're trying to make? And as you get further away from the end of that strategic planning process and into that unknown future, that filter becomes, okay, well, we know the direction that we're trying to go and there's reasons for it, right? There's, there's evidence behind it. And now we're encountering situations and being able to say, okay, does this decision, does this direction align with this bigger move that we're trying to make, or is it, you know, carrying off, carrying us off in another direction? Because if there's anything I've learned in higher ed is that there's opportunities everywhere, right? That you could go do good work in a thousand different directions. But the real challenge is finding the one, or not the one, but the handful of right directions and right decisions to make that carry you in that strategic direction. Because you know, ultimately, if we're all running around in, in different directions and trying to accomplish different things and not in a coordinated, synergized way, we're we're going to have an impact, but maybe not as great of an impact if we were to bring those that that effort and that work together across disciplines, across areas, you know, on campus. That you know, we're really focusing in on how do we drive the outcomes and the impacts we're trying to have. So I ho I hope that answers the question. It does, and I'll keep I'll keep asking questions. So Wes, you have to jump in and hold me back. Mm -hmm. I'm passionate about you. this topic. I got you. <laughs> Thank you. So one more question for you, Chris. Um, I heard you say right path. And I think for so many of us, especially as young professionals coming into higher education, it can seem like every path is the right path, right? And depending upon what lens you look at, at it through, it might be. So how do you recommend and how do you lead your teams to, towards identifying what these right paths are? And do you have any advice for how to identify them? And that question also goes to John too. <laughs> uh, so I'm actually uh, making a, a, a pitch 
this afternoon, right after this recording, uh, for for this is your warm up. <laughs> exactly. This thing. How do we how do we assess the work ahead of us? Assess multiple different types of requests, multiple different opportunities, and say, okay, of these, many, you know, we could get. I'm going to make up numbers here. There could be a hundred, you know, requests in front of us, and they could all be really good things. They could all be, you know, have a lot of merit to them. But which of these is feasible for us to actually take in and accomplish? And then which of these are going to create the most value in alignment with, you know, the direction of other departments on campus and, and you know, other teams in a way that, you know, we're saying, yeah, there's many good things. There's many right things. But but for us to be strategic, we have to select the the handful of things we can realistically accomplish, get those things done rather than, yeah, we had 100 good ideas and we're we're working on all of them. All of them are in flight, but none of them are actually getting done. We're not actually seeing the benefit of any of them. So it's it's really a way to, like I said, be able to say no to really good ideas because they're not right for the right time. Right. Well, if everything's a priority, nothing is. Yeah, there's Stanley Fish had you had a great cynical response to the you know the old standby about how there's no such thing as a as a bad as a bad question. Um, he said, there's no such thing as a bad question, but some are better than others. <laughs> you know, it's like but, <laughs> a strategic plan is what allows you to sort of decide priorities. And I'll just say it based on lots of experience that, you know, your strategic plan is authentic and, and powerful and strong when everybody tries to fall all over themselves saying that their initiative that they're requesting money for is is aligned with the strategic plan. When they don't do that, you know you don't have a plan that's that's being seen as serious. But when you do, people will say, yeah, but I need money for this thing because it's going to advance the strategic priorities. Along those lines, I just feel super strongly about this one thing I'll say now. And that is that um, go into a strategic planning process with everything aligned around having just a handful of priorities. And that's a tough one for higher ed. Because, you know, to our to our credit, we're all about inclusion in everything. You know, we want everybody to feel valued and our campuses do every, do so much, you know. So how are you going to have a plan that prioritizes just three, four, maybe five things? It's hard to do. Um, I've been on campuses and we said at the very beginning, we are going to only have six priorities because if we have more than that, then everything's a priority. And so we said we're only going to have six we get to the end of the process and we've got 12 <laughs> and you know and 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 the, there was an english major on the on the on the group who said hey i can combine them with semicolons and and now we're only have six well <laughs> if you know if you have a sort of a frankensteinian uh, uh stitching together of then it, again it, if you can come up with just a few and really i and to full disclosure i i couldn't do it i mean you know, I'd be on a campus and we'd have, you know, how can you not have something about academics? How can you not have something about students? How can you not have something about diversity and inclusion? How can you not have something about, you know, and then pretty soon the real estate's all used up. And then then it's a question of what are you going to say isn't a priority? And that's that's hard. But I was at Educause, we did our first strategic plan after I arrived in 20. 17, 16, and then uh, rolled it out in 2017. And we had only three priorities. And it was amazing what you can do when you just have three. And, um, and this is our strategic plan for this next three to five years, it fits on a laminated page. And so we can bring it out and show it to people. And it only has three priorities. And that i um, just so pleased about that doesn't mean that all the other stuff that has to happen that's operational that's important that's ongoing doesn't happen it just means that for the next three to five years these th these three things are our areas of focus so for what it's worth um maybe people listening are smarter and better than i am and are going to figure a way to do it on a campus it's a challenge though yeah so john if, if i may i actually have a question so i had an opportunity to read through i believe there was an article that you authored that kind of discussed, gave us a little context to the EDUCAUSE plan. And in the section on, uh, I think it was risk and resiliency, or somewhere within there, there was a section where we, we spoke and said that uh, though innovation definitely plays a role in setting direction of strategic planning, often 
the risk and resiliency of a particular institution plays a great role. It didn't say greater, but I kind of read from it that it could play a greater role. I'll say in my own uh, personal experience, the risk appetite of a particular institution generally played an even bigger role than coming with innovative ideas. But yeah. connecting it to a recent episode, the last episode we did for this podcast when we were debunking myths for young professionals, one of the things that came up is that, you know, young professionals, we tend to feel like we get brought to the table when folks want new and different and refreshing ideas. So we get limited experience in understanding the risk and resilience of a particular institution. So I, I'll get to the question now. What would be wait, some wait, We haven't even been to the question yet? Yeah, we haven't even got to the question. I want to paint the picture. I was, always, I was already saying I don't know if I can remember this question. I'm glad this isn't a job interview. <laughs> The so is the question, up. with that humble wind up, right? The humble wind up. The, the, the question is: are, are there things that either one of you have learned over this, whether through this process or throughout your career, that you want to pass on to young professionals of how to build up that understanding of the resilience piece that seems to play a big role in planning, and how they can come to the table with a more holistic view? Because there's a hunger out there for young professionals to be a little bit more involved with strategic planning. So I pose that. You want me to start, Chris, or do you want to start? Take well, I, I heard a couple themes, and both both I really want to talk about. Um, and, and and one is sort of you the strategic priority. Let me check. Strategic priority number two. Unfortunately, my eyes are so bad I have to look at my screen. Strategic priority number two is build institutional capabilities to manage risk and build resilience in an era of systemic change. And what I love about that is if there was ever an, an area where we tend to be reactive and not strategic, it's risk. We, we I mean, the, the part of risk management that can be very strategic is if you have a risk register. You know, Educause has a risk register template we can share with you. But, you know, then you're starting to get ahead of the risk as opposed to responding to it when it when it happens and that and both are necessary. But but uh, this focus that we have for the next three to five years on on resilience sort of becomes the strategic framework to approach risk. I mean, if if yes, managing risk is important, managing, managing, managing strategic approach to risk is say, how do we change our institutions? How do we transform our institutions to be more resilient, to be able to react, uh, proactively prevent a bad thing from happening? And then when the inevitable bad thing happens, how do we stay strong? How do we, how do we, um, deal with it in a competent way. And that that's why I really love yoking those two together. Um, your other question, and you used a, a word that I was going to get back to, which is the table, right? That's like the, that, that must be the one of the most persistent um, questions, frustrations, lamentations of young professionals. It, it's like, you know, the table's out there and you want to be at the table. Who wouldn't want to be at the table? Um, but how do you get to the table and, and how do you behave when you're at the table? And strategic planning is a particularly tricky one because it tends to be senior people, which demographically is going to rule out people and no, not, you know, not maliciously, but it's going to, if, if, if you're not a seasoned leader, if you, if you've only been there, you know, a certain number of years. So that's a really tricky thing, but what, what you can do, first of all, is remember, I talk about strategic planning throughout an organization. So you know, you may not be at the table for the for the college or university plan, but you could be the person who says to the CIO at the organization, hey, I noticed we don't have a technology plan. I'd love to work on that. Um, I'd love to, you know, I'd love to put together a group and help with that. Nothing more powerful to get at a table than to than to, as my wife used to always say to the kids, make yourself indispensable. Make yourself indispensable. Volunteer for stuff that's important, and and so you know you and that that you know and then you never know. Maybe you know maybe you get noticed as a person on campus who is passionate, competent, and willing to do the work on this. Um, you're going to get people's attention for for that. Um, but I do think you know the the infusion of strategic thinking is also valuable, whether or not. It's directly you. You personally are directly involved in in the planning process. So with that, but Chris, go ahead. Yeah, I, yeah. I was gonna I was gonna jump in on that. You know, the the conversation around the table as well. And and if there's one thing I really want to impart to higher education, you know, institutions, you know, IT maybe specifically is th there's there's a real a great need to avoid the echo chamber. 
right? Of, of the same people always having the same conversations, always moving in the same direction. There, there's there's a lot that can be lost there. So I think, you know, while young professionals may have a bit of a uh, an appetite for more innovation and, and risky moves, I think, you know, really the the position that I, you know, I've, I really valued young professionals in our institution last time we went through strategic planning, uh, the, the perspective that they brought was, well, no, these are the lived experiences of our customers. Here's the here's what they're going through. And so then then it almost becomes a risk to not address these things, right? To to answer that question or like my least favorite phrase I, I hear on campus all the time is, well, this is the way we've always done this, right? It's it's leveraging the the talent of the young professionals to question those things and say, well, why is that the case? Here's the, you know, the, here's the harm that this is causing our institution by carrying these legacy decisions that have you know, been made a decade or more ago into the future. Like we got to drop those things and we've got to do it in a way that builds, you know, risk, risk tolerance and resilience and, all, you know, all these other things for the institution. But sometimes it's the, the risky thing to do is to continue doing the same thing. So that, that, that's, that's, you know, really where, you know, I've seen young professionals really excel is, is coming at things with fresh eyes and, and being and, able to ask those questions. And, you know, you, 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 Sarah, I think maybe before we started recording or, or I heard somebody make some comment about, you know, young professionals are called on when they need a fresh perspective and a fresh voice. Like that's the, that's the collective superpower of young professionals, all true. But I do think you, young professionals also need to think about having more than one voice. You know, if if that's your, you know, you have a risk of being a one trick pony if that's your thing and people only call on you when that, you know, that's going to limit. So I just think, I think always, and, and to Chris, what you said about, you know, the, the opposite of the young, of the sort of collective young professional voice, which is new, 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 is that we've always done it this way, old, old, old. And, you know, I would encourage young professionals not to fall into a binary that there are things about the way we've always done things that are really, really good. There are mm -hmm. things that are new that are really, really good. And, you know, this is the era of two, two letter uh, acronyms. You know, we're all uh, running around, falling all over ourselves, talking about AI. There's another AI that people who are old professionals like me remember, and it's uh, an, an initiative, I guess, or a, a movement a while back called Appreciative Inquiry. And if you don't know, if you've never heard that, look it up. It's such a powerful way of approaching problems that I think it would be great if young professionals embrace, because it it doesn't say there's bad and good. It, it Appreciative Inquiry says there's a problem. Can we find one place on campus that has solved it? You know. But let's say that you have a problem on campus with, you know, thing A and, you know, it's a problem all over. But is there one department, one unit who has figured out how to do it better? And let's lift, let's find a way as a culture to lift those up. And I would say that's the voice for the young professional, not just new, 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 old is bad, 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 bad. But let's think differently about, about the, and let's find things that are new within our own org. I mean, we have the answers these issues about enrollment and blah, 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 and workforce retention, we know the answers are within us, but what department isn't suffering a retention problem? <laughs> let's let's dig into that, who's not? And, and it changes the conversation. It makes things positive. And boy, wouldn't it be great if you were the person who steered the conversation in that direction? And I just, I'd, I'd encourage people to, to think about that. The last thing, and then I'll, I'll be quiet for at least a little bit, is I have to share, and I can't remember who said it, it's probably attributed to everybody from Winston Churchill to Maya Angelou, but it's it's some amazing person said, um, I'm not I'm not looking for a place at the table. I want to change the table. <laughs> and I love that. I love that because that is fundamentally what needs to happen. It, we need to change how we bring people together, how we make decisions. We we just we shouldn't be leaving out major voices like young professionals and others. So we need to. Yeah, and and that would be a fantastic conversation to be a part of. Well, I think we have an opportunity for it. <laughs> and I'm actually one of my questions, you know, channeling this appreciative inquiry lens um, is how would you recommend that folks get started on that, John? How can we 
flip the script, change the table, so to speak, and bring more of those maybe disparate groups together in new ways? You know, you can really think about, um, I, I used to work in an office in a department of academic affairs as a provost. And every month, I think it was, this is back when everything was on, on campus. Every month, the academic affairs department would take another department out to lunch. And it was as a thank you. And it was, it was just a way to thank a department. And so, you know, after a, I think we did it every other month or something. So after a, after a year, you took six departments out to lunch and built relationships and built connections. And can you think of anything more, more powerful than that? You know, you remember that whole, people don't remember what you said, but they remember how you made them feel like, are, are you, you just sort of do a Rolodex of your conversations with people for the last day. How did you make them feel? Like to, are you sprinkling throughout, you know, these where you are the one reaching out to connect with people? Because when people are setting a table, they're looking for people who they want at the table, who are gracious and who are thoughtful and courteous. And, you know, you you can find ways to make it clear to everybody around that that's you by doing things like that, finding ways to be be the person in your department who, you know, imagine you, you're leaving in five years. What are they going to say about you when you leave? Oh, Wes, he was so thoughtful. Uh, he used to do this and he used to do that. I mean, that... Th those kinds of things. I mean, you know, and also be really damn good at your job and be competent, you know, you know, just, just do everything perfectly is all. And then, and then you're good. No pressure. <laughs> yeah. No pressure. Where are we at on the team? <laughs> if, if I mean, I want to double down just a bit on what you just shared, John, because probably one of the most impactful things that happened in my career. So I used to report to an amazing CIO. His name is Timothy Chester, uh, works at the university of Georgia. And I when he that. first got there, uh, when he first got there, uh, we IT had just become kind of a central department. So there was a lot of trust that we were rebuilding and they had done a lot of great work. One of the seemingly minor at the time things he did that I think really played a big role in where, what he's been able to accomplish up to now is similar to what you just said. He set up quarterly meetings with the deans. He would invite multiple IT folks, depending on the topic, and then he would open the invite to whoever the dean wanted to invite to the meeting. And we would literally just meet to share what we've been working on at a high level and ask them what their technology needs are. And it would just be a quick 45 minute meeting. But those were his same allies when we started getting to the big, hard meetings that we had to have. when we really had to start saying no to this or saying yes to that. And uh, I, I copied that same mythology in my own career and was able to see success just on doing that. I've never been much of an innovative person. I, I try to get to the simplest solution possible. Uh, but it made it a lot easier because I'd already built that rapport and kind of followed that similar model. So I just wanted to put that out there into the universe. Well, isn't it, yeah, isn't it funny that we, we like, think of every conversation in your life you've had about EQ. And I'll bet, I'll bet every single instance of that was EQ in leaders. <laughs> but you need EQ all over the map. You know, you need EQ as a young professional, maybe more than anybody because you're, you're navigating some tricky waters trying to what's my place what's my lane what's my voice you know i think we should be doing eq training emotional intelligence training for young professionals not just wait till you're a leader and then you know you, you, you but if you haven't figured out eq by the time you're a leader you're probably in trouble and these these gestures like i said and like you just said you know this is such a strange thing to say but I could tell you every single person at work who came to my mom or dad's funeral. Like, like I can tell you each and every one. I could tell you where they sat in the church because I it was so powerful to me that they took time to come. And I wasn't a big special thing. It was just because of the relationships that they cared enough to come. And just think about stuff like that. And again, you don't wait to be a leader to do it. Like what if and and I'll say everybody who came were seasoned people who I worked, you know, would have blown my mind if somebody who had only worked at the campus for three or four years showed up. That would have really um, given given me something to think about. Anyway, I don't that may not be apropos of nothing. Jerry will just edit it out, probably, but <laughs> <laughs> not going to edit know, that likes... one out. Not going to edit that one out. That was a great <laughs> point. Jerry likes likes us to do this live. So. <laughs> 
well, he's quiet, but he's making notes. <laughs> Um, you know, we've been talking about emotional intelligence, and I just think that is such a great example of a skill that is necessary for strategic thinking. And my question to Chris and, and John really is, we've been talking about emotional intelligence as this necessary skill. But strategic thinking, you know, when I think about it, it can be so many things. And how might you describe strategic thinking and what are those underlying skill sets? that you would recommend young professionals can start honing or prioritizing as they start building their careers and moving towards these executive leadership roles? Thank you. Good question. Uh, you know, first, I just, I'm feeling a little um, thinking over what I said, because I also want to acknowledge, I mean, you know, lifting up emotional intelligence and EQ is not going to surprise anybody because it it sometimes maybe especially lately feels like a skill that's <laughs> society is lacking but um I'll also just acknowledge neurodiversity is a thing and you know the collective conversation around it's really good to have somebody who's highly analytic you know who maybe you don't want to hear the first thing that's going to come out of their mouth but they're the person who next day is going to come back with a very Thoughtful. So, I mean, it takes everybody and the collective and the collective strategic voice should include all these other voices as well. And I don't I, I tend to value the emotional intelligence part, but um, I don't want to say that that's the only thing that that matters. And I think the second part of your question was, how do young professionals? Okay. Yeah, you're you're on it. So really, my question is pretty broad, but. We've been talking about emotional intelligence, of course, is this necessary help? Oh, how do you skill. prepare for it? Yeah. So how, how can young professionals really, you know, what other skills can they be honing and thinking about as we grow and progress in our roles towards those senior leadership positions? Well, I I think Chris needs to get a word in here edgewise. So I'm I'll just say one thing and then hand the mic to him. And I to me it's probably project management. Um, you know, and that's been a it's been a long journey in higher ed. Um, you know, I used to say that the best you could hope for in higher ed was project management light. <laughs> you know, you you can't sit and talk about float and things like that um, in higher ed. And I actually had a terrible experience with project management that didn't go well because it was um, made to be highly bureaucratic and everything. Now, project management meant taking three times as long to do everything you want to do because you have to do a charter and you have to do this, you know, as opposed to picking up the phone and calling somebody. So um, I think learning project management, learning some of the fundamentals of project management, because that's the, that's not strategic. It's, but it's tactically, it's the, it's the structure on which you build the execution of a strategic plan and having some familiarity with that, I think can be really helpful. But Chris, what do you think? So, so that, that's actually what got me invited to uh, to plan and 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 build our strategic planning process was was expertise in in project management. So yeah, underscore that completely. Um, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna quote uh, Michael Berman, uh, former CIO of the California State University System, um, he, former he, Educause uh, board member. Yeah, former <laughs> Educause. Uh, he, he told me right, strategic planning in is in, in its you know most fundamental state is an exercise in deep listening. And and so I that that's really stuck with me, right? And, and and I've said it this way, right? Strategic planning has to start with empathy. If you if you don't start with empathy, right? Having empathy for your customers, what are their pain points? What are their experiences? What are what are they going through? Or what challenges are ahead of them that they need? Uh, you know, IT's assistance. You know, man, you know, scaling a mountain. You know, that's ahead of them. If you don't start there, if you start with IT folks in the room saying, well, what should we be doing? You know, and we're, we're sitting here talking about AI for AI's sake. There, there has to be a, a practical you know, expectation of how is this going to be useful for, for the campus in the future? So I think I think starting there, the other, the other thing that really comes to mind for me is uh, being very open to hearing negative feedback and not becoming defensive in that. You know, this is this is the thing that we were we were telling our campus going through the strategic planning process is we want us to tell you where we're failing you. We want us, you know, we want you to tell us where we're where we're you know sucking. And so because we want to be better. And and we had to we had to coach our our IT leadership team to say, like, 
look, don't don't start off by being defensive. Don't try to solve the problem when someone says it. Just listen, hear what they're having to say, and then bring those things together. So that gets into the EQ part of it, right? Is is making sure that you're positioning yourself in a in a way that you're open and receptive to hearing what they're saying and not just solutioning right away. Because you know, strategic planning, you're not trying to solve today's problems and only today's problems. You're trying to solve today's problems, tomorrow's problems, the you know, five years from now, the problems that you could experience. So I, I think that's that's you know a lot of those skills that young professionals I would I would advocate for them to start developing now is the ability to really listen, not be defensive, not try to especially IT folks, not try to solve everything right away, but to sit, tip it, take a step back, be contemplative about it, and say, well, what does this what does this mean collectively? You know, we're hearing this from multiple places, multiple customers. Well, what does this mean systematically? What what should we be doing? You know, that's that's a really good point at uh, across all stages of a person's career. Certainly a, as a as a leader, that's been a hallmark for me. Um, would I have even said it's a emerging superpower? Because I, uh, you know, in, in my career, uh, careers as a leader, when I've asked, when I've hired, um, mostly thinking right now of, of chief diversity officers, the first conversation I had was, if you're not making me com- uncomfortable on a fairly regular basis, you may not be doing your job. Like, and 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 I've told every VP at Educause, I want you to tell me what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. And and I think they've gotten based on the number of things I hear that I don't want to hear. I want to say that <laughs> that people do feel. And you know, again, why is that just a leader thing? I think Chris is right. Like that that can be a feature of you in your first major professional, you know, tell me what I need to hear. That is strategic. I mean, yes, it's empathy and it's all the good stuff in that quadrant of, of, of thinking, but it's also pretty damn smart. Like, you know, wouldn't you want your boss to be honest and tell you when you're doing things that fall below her expectations? Wouldn't you want to probe and coach and get that out because it shows you care and you, you know, I don't know. I think it's a really, emerging necessity for a successful young professional and absolutely as a successful leader. And I'm also hearing a bit of a, maybe a, a, a slight call to action to the higher education community that, you know, as us in leadership positions, when we're thinking about our own strategic plans, looking for opportunities to bring folks who may not be as experienced in that process, even if it's just a small time to focus on something very focused in on their work to, help them exercise those muscles so that when they do get in these seats, they're more prepared than we were uh, the first time we had to come up with a strategic plan. (laughs) Well, uh, Wes, you just gave me an idea that I didn't think of um, until I listened to you. And it's, you know, wouldn't it be a cool thing if if when I was doing the Educause strategic plan and I had my key people of seven people or whoever it was that, that I worked with, I should have asked each one of them to work with their staff, you know, set up similar groups with their staff. Now, I think honestly, most of them did it, but but you know, and 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 at those at that table, you know, there's not just one table. There's the big table, and then there's tables that individual, you know, that the CIO at an organization creates. So, you know, um, what would it be like if the C, the CEO who's on the strategic planning group held a meeting with with their staff, and that would be a point where not young professionals could shine. Lesson to learn for all of us. We'll remember that next time we do our do our plans. I know we're cutting up on time now, though it sounds like maybe another episode with this group is in order in the future. <laughs> I, there's many other questions I wish we had time to ask, uh, but uh, I just wanted to express my gratitude, uh, Chris, John, both of you for joining us and giving us this very insightful confirmation. I'm, I'm over here writing my own notes, getting my own nuggets uh, out of this to bring back to my own team as we're going through a strategic planning process ourselves. So I'm even learning my own lessons through this. Uh, but uh, Sarah, is there anything else we wanted to get out before we take it home? Um, I think I am okay with questions. Thank you. I just wanted to say, you know, for our audience especially, um, this podcast welcomes your feedback and questions. And if you have any for John or Chris or any of our future guests or ideas, we welcome you reaching out. Um, and you can also follow us on the Educause platform or anywhere you get your podcasts. With that, we're the Rise of Voices podcast. 
Thank you so much again. We will see y'all in the next episode.